Simon Brown here. Uh, today we're looking at the Ukraine war effects, particularly we're focusing on commodities and FX uh, and brought to you in conjunction with markets.com. They're going to be listing their local uh, indices, Resi, Finney, Oshare and Top 40 coming mid-April. Those of you who know me, uh, indices, what I like to trade most of all. So we've got the presentation, you've got questions. As always, drop them into the Q&A box. We've certainly got time for questions. Uh, this is going to be lots of pictures and charts uh, and, and a tricky space. We are literally into our, you know, five weeks and one day into, into the war, uh, five and a half day, five weeks, half a day into the war. Um, and it's changed a lot already. And we'll talk about some of that as we go through. I thought let's start with how's the war going. Now, how's it going for Ukraine? Horrible. Their country's being attacked. Cities are being destroyed. I mean, you know, people are dying. People are fleeing. Half of Ukrainians, half of Kiev have left the city. Make no mistake, they are not having a good war. There are no good wars for the for the victims in it. But let's try to get a sense of, what I'm trying to understand here is how long does it potentially last? What is Putin trying to achieve? And is there an end game here in, in some sense? Now, yeah, this is a picture of my report, and it is actually a week old, so it's probably worse. This is a southern city down in the Black Sea, hugely important for Putin. I'll come to why the importance in a moment. But essentially, he is just leveling the city, just absolutely destroying it. There have been some great uh, uh, articles coming out from, from journalists who've managed to flee the city, uh, how they got out, what it was like in the city. And it is just a city being absolutely decimated. It's an easier target for Russia because it's right there. There are other targets that are obviously going to be uh, significantly harder. Ah, my audio dropped a second, but we are back, as we we're witnessing with Kiev. Um, but the, 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 the rockets, the airstrikes, the artillery, in other words, long range, not capturing the city so much as destroying the city. And we've seen this from Putin before in other wars he's fought, and ultimately uh, you destroy the city uh, and then perhaps easier to capture in theory. Uh, it's, it's the old school. It's the idea of, of essentially laying a city under siege uh, and, and, and you know, lobbing whatever into it to try and damage it and wear down the, 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 the populace. That said, overall, the war's been perhaps a bit of a of a of a of a of a mismatch. Now, let's be clear. You know, what's the first casualty of war? Truth. The story we're getting is, you know, we think, well, it's coming from the US, the UK, Ukraine. It's true. Nah. No, no, no. I, the truth is a casualty in war. You know, the, the idea that farmers are, are are basically going off with with uh, Russian artillery and tanks, etc., that has died on the side of the road. It's probably true. The idea that Putin probably expected a fairly quick victory, probably true. He's been um, turning off webcam because my internet is struggling. The idea that perhaps uh, he's been lied to by his generals and uh, folks on the ground, maybe it is. Um, is there strong resistance and stronger resistance from Ukrainians than perhaps expected? That's quite possibly true as well. And if you put all of that together, certainly I would expect that Putin is not happy that uh, five weeks in, and in essence, he is still having to fight this fight, that he hasn't as yet uh, uh, got to, 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 to where he's, you know, where he's like within sniffing distance of, of, of uh, uh, the, 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 the victory that obviously he wanted. Michael, I'm seeing your questions. Bitcoins, we'll come to them. We've got space for Bitcoin, most definitely. So I think there's no, no, no doubt that this is not going as well as Putin had expected, uh, that it's going poorly. Is he losing? Is it going to be totally decimated? Time will tell. It's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, there are peace negotiations ongoing. Two things around peace negotiations. Let's say the war ends tonight. We wake up tomorrow and there is peace in Ukraine. Do the sanctions disappear? Mm, surely not. I mean, you don't invade a, a, an independent country, spend five weeks bombing the heck out of it, and then say, sorry, my bad, go home, and everything's okay. Surely. I, I mean, that, that can't be how the world works. So the, 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 the sanctions will remain. But also, what does Putin want from the war? And we'll get to that in a sec. What we're seeing is these sanctions. And this is important. This looks fairly impressive. 
lots of sanctions happening, lots of, 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 of governments around the world imposing sanctions, uh, SWIFT blocking some Russian banks. Uh, Russian central bank having the US dollar reserves essentially confiscated, which definitely was a first. But note what is not, what's missing from here, because it's often the missing that matters more. And in this case, what's missing from here is commodities. Hards, softs, agries, precious, energy, no commodities. And that, I think, is the, the weak spot in what we're seeing from, from the, the, the Western response, is that you know, Putin's lifeblood is particularly energy into, into, into Western Europe, and that he's still selling. Now, sure, you know, I mean, all sorts of worries. There was talk about some self-sanctioning up front. We'll get to that in a moment. But what we're not seeing is, you know, energy uh, sanctions, uh, PGM sanctions, uh, agri sanctions. Those are not yet happening. Here's the southern part. So there are reports coming through about 24, 36 hours ago uh, that Putin was, he says he's withdrawing from around Kiev. Uh, I watched the, uh, uh, secretary, the press secretary for Secretary of State in the US doing an interview last night. He's very purposely using the word that the troops are repositioning. Are they moving? Yes. Are they withdrawing? Uh, let's see, and this is mostly in Kiev, north and northwest Kiev, uh, not 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 shown on the map, and maybe they're just going back into Belarus to 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 resupply, to to you know get new armaments, new food, more etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We don't know at this point. It is early, early days. My sense is that Putin, Russia taking over Ukraine is off is off. It's not going. He's not going to get all of Ukraine. He's looking for some sort of peace. The, the two key points around the peace, and again, you know, remember, truth is the first casualty in war, and probably also in in, in peace talks. My sense of 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 what he's really f focusing on, giving up on the re on, on the rest of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is promising that they will be neutral, uh, and what Putin wants is this corridor down south. Now he has Crimea which he annexed in 2014, and that in of itself should have been the alarm bells, but uh, be that matter as it may. He annexed that in 2014, and he's basically trying to create a land bridge back to Russia. Now, he's got an ocean bridge. I mean, no problem. I mean, you can skip across here. There's a sea, no problem. But trying to create that land bridge back to Russia. He's already claimed that the territories down here are Russian. And they are. There's 85 percent. 85 percent of the people in, in, in the area of the of, of the colored area of the map there are Russian speakers. Are they Russian? Well, they say they're Ukrainian. He says he's got support. There's been skirmishes and and wars, not war, but skirmishes, perhaps the phraseology we use, happening in this area since the annexation of Crimea in 2014. I think he wants to create that land bank. I don't see Zelensky. And Ukraine, particularly with with Russia, seemingly on the back foot. I don't see them turning around and saying, "Cool, have part of my country." Again, why? I mean, they're not, you know, they 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 they're not losing the way they thought, right? You know, Russia hasn't just steamed rolled over Ukraine and taken the entire country in in literally just matters of of of, of hours or perhaps days. Uh, this map from uh, two days ago. Uh, 11 o'clock South African time, 21 GMT. So this fairly up to date. And from the UK Ministry of Defence, again, a good source. But again, you know, the whole understanding that first casualty in war it is uh, truth. So, you know, and, and it's difficult to get information out to the point about are oh, the Russians pulling back or repositioning? You know, as the Defence Secretary spokesperson was saying last night, um, they are moving. Where are they moving and what is their intention? I mean, even if they go back to Ukraine, I mean, that's pulling back, but it doesn't mean they can't just refuel, pick up supplies, uh, et cetera, and then return. You know, there's no certainty around that at all. So lots is still happening here. It is massively uh, a fluid situation. No surprise. That is what war is. So let's look at the commodities most at risk from, from, from this war. Um, this is Frontier View. Uh, PwC uh, use it as their uh, reference point, so we can trust the data for this. Right at the top, sunflower oil, 
uh, that is huge and you're gonna you've probably already seen some impact uh, sunflower is a massive export this is from Ukraine Russia and Belarus so it's from all three Belarus is not directly involved but their territory has been used to invade up in uh, northern northeastern uh, Ukraine so they're certainly inv involved in some degree neon and fertilizer are important let's touch on fertilizer for, first uh, commodity prices in the agri space are booming that's wonderful but unfortunately, two key inputs are also booming. Diesel, petrol, whatever the farmers use, mostly diesel. Prices pretty much at record highs wherever you look. Uh, and second to that, obviously, fertilizer costs. Again, record highs. And this is not new. I mean, I, I was chatting with folks like Mohammed Nala, uh, probably August of last year, around the energy slash fertilizer crisis that was sweeping across Europe. And that's part of the trick. It's not like we came into this war where, you know, everything was fine. Supply chains were working, uh, uh, you know, energy prices weren't elevated, agri prices weren't elevated. They all were. And this is just ex extenuating that, that, that process. Um, neon is important. So neon is the funky lights that you see at the disco, but neon is also used in producing silicon chips. You want a clean environment, you need neon to produce that silicon, that environment, and most of that neon is produced in Odessa. So at this point, Odessa is fine, and allegedly there are good stockpiles, and there's probably supply for about another uh, uh, eight to 12 months. So we've got neon for the rest of the year, but that could start to get into a problem. Uh, wheat, palladium, palladium particularly important, and I'll come to why in a moment. It's that 24% number that I really, really like. Barley, rapeseed, uh, nickel corn, coal, yeah, we'll come to coal. Crude, and again down here, natural gas. On a global side, Neither of them are giant, well, I mean, 12% and 9% are not small numbers, but they're not, they're not you know, the, the biggest in the world. But they are if you're Europe. If you're Germany, it's 50% of your supply. I mean, you know, so you know, it, it's not necessarily impacting us directly down here in Southern Africa, but it is a, 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 a bunch of it. And uh, there are certainly a, a concerns around it. And we'll come to those in a whole lot more detail in a, in, in a moment. Uh, raw aluminium, natural gas, iron steel, platinum, copper, cobalt, soya beans. The biggies here are your energies, which is uh, crude and natural gas, uh, your commodities, corn and wheat, and then your PGMs. Quick point on the PGMs. You hear a lot of people tell you that Russia is 40% of palladium supply, and that number is correct if you do not include recycling. But you've got to include recycling because recycling is a part of the supply chain, which is why I said the palladium number at 24, I agreed with. It, 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 it made sense. And uh, platinum at, 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 at 8%. Some variances on the margins. This is Johnson Matthey, who undoubtedly are the experts in the PGM space. So if you bring recycling into the equation, Russia is about a quarter of palladium. These haven't been sanctioned. And that's partly the issue. And there's other you know, chip suppliers and stuff. We're going to come to more on that in a moment. But it is a chunky number. It absolutely is a chunky number. Uh, global oil supply by country. Uh, so this is 2020. Oil usage has gone up a bit since then because, of course, 2020 was lockdowns. Uh, so this is total use of about 94 million barrels a day. We're now sitting at about 96 to 98 million barrels a day. Uh, U.S. is giant. That's mostly for their own usage. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, second, that is mostly for export. Russia sitting third at 10.5 million barrels a day. Then Canada, China, Iraq, UAE, Brazil, Iran, and Kuwait. Let's quickly touch on Iran. Iran's not unimportant in this game at all, simply because Iran, Iranian oil is currently embargoed. Uh, because of the, the, the Trump basically cancelled the Iranian uh, peace uh, treaty that was in place, um, or a, a nuclear treaty, whatever the phraseology is. So we've certainly seen that uh, uh, Iran, Iranian oil could come back on, but this doesn't happen quickly. And the idea that, that Saudi Arabia can just wander down to a pump somewhere and turn a tap and more oil spews out is slightly true. Absolutely it is for a couple of hundred thousand barrels. But if we're talking millions of barrels, we are probably six to 12 months to getting proper extra supply onto the market. In other words, the, the, the crunch is going to be for a while. The thing with the Russian, if that Russian 10 and a half million barrels a day had disappeared off the market, oil would be $300 right now 
and, and we would have a, a demand collapse in the oil price and things would go haywire. Russian oil is still being sold. Remember I said earlier, note what wasn't on the sanction list, energy. Europe is still buying Russian energy. And, and this is a massive failure on behalf of Europe. Now, let's be clear. You know, Germany can't, Schultz, uh, can't just go, Chancellor Schultz can't just go and turn off the Nord Stream gas pipelines coming out of Russia. His country will go plunging into darkness. But let's also be clear. Russia annexed Crimea eight years ago. Europe's had eight years to solve this problem. And what have they done in those eight years? They built another pipeline from Russia, Nord Stream 2. I, I, I'm sorry, like, like, like which part of like that's just stupid don't they seem to understand so that is the 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 the, the i suppose the not the ace but the card that putin holds europe is dependent on his energy now he's talked about uh, uh you know wanting payment from unfriendly countries in rubles truthfully they'll pay they'll pay whatever he wants seashells they'll pay it bitcoin they'll pay it i mean they need the energy and so far all indications, particularly in gas and oil as well, is that the flow is still happening. Gazprom is booking uh, uh, pipelines. They basically book it on a daily basis. The flow is happening into Europe, and that is funding Russia. Now, it's not funding the Russian on the street. No, of course not. It's, it's funding the elites, the oligarchs, Putin, uh, the, the army. Uh, although who he buys weapons from, I'm not sure. I mean, I have ideas around that. China, Saudi Arabia. Where does Saudi Arabia get theirs from? America. This starts to get very, very messy. Um, but it's that keeping Russia going in many, many senses. If Europe turned around tomorrow and said no more energy from Russia, well, Russia would be over in a week or two. Unfortunately, so would Europe. As I said, they've had eight years of warning, haven't heeded it. We are where we are right now. That, that's another whole story in its entirety. What we did see in the early days, the first two weeks of the war, was kind of self-sanctioning. And what I mean by that, one of the, the, the oil companies, uh, state-owned oil companies out of Western Siberia, was putting two million barrels a day of, between two to four million barrels a day of oil on auction onto the market, and they were getting takers for less than a million. And the reason was quite simple. Companies like Shell, who eventually dragged their feet and said, okay, they didn't want to be buying Russian oil because bad PR. Uh, other people were worried that you might buy the Russian oil, but there's counterparty risk. What happens if you deposit the money into a bank and that bank gets uh, locked out of SWIFT and now you haven't got your money and you haven't got your oil? So there was certainly some talk of some self-sanctioning. Ditto with the PGMs. You could buy it, but you didn't want to because you were either worried about reputational risk or perhaps you're actually just a good person and don't want to deal with a thug like Putin, or perhaps you were literally worried about something breaking in the system. There were reports of Putin offering oil at $20 to $30 discounts and still struggling to sell. There were reports that he would send oil to China uh, and sell to China. Problem is no, no, no pipeline to China, so now you've got to use uh, uh, oil tankers, and you've still got a global supply chain crisis. It's not like we can suddenly get, you know, the hundreds of, of oil tankers required to suddenly get into, into the, 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 the land around Russia and take that oil off to China. Over time, sure, but in the immediate, not. Looking at the price action, Russian oil is flowing again. People are buying it. They absolutely are, which is why I mentioned earlier, the sanctions are great, but, uh, you know, like to what point? No, it's some oligoths uh, losing their yachts and everything. Nasty, but no way significant. Top wheat producing, uh, China, India, Russia. Uh, United States, France, Canada, and then Ukraine. Here's the thing. Wheat is a winter crop. They're just coming out of winter. It is harvest time for wheat right now. Are farmers harvesting? Russian farmers? Sure, absolutely. Ukrainian farmers? As far as they can. Sure. Ukraine has put restrictions on some of the agries that you can export, but it's not wheat, it's not maize, it's, you know, it's soya, it's lima beans, it's other bits and pieces which you're currently not, not able to export out of, of Ukraine. But it's just the logistics of doing it uh, during a war. Now, a lot of this is out of Western uh, Ukraine, so the wheat is able to get out, but certainly there's going to be a shortfall. And again, are folks going to want to buy Russian wheat? 
well, certainly not from a moral perspective, no problem seemingly, but maybe from a practical perspective, it's going to be difficult. How do you get that wheat physically out of Russia? Black Sea is, is a no-go at this point in time. Uh, the, the North Sea, uh, pretty much equally a no-go at this point in time. So I don't know how you practically get it out. Wheat is definitely a big concern, and we've seen it in, in the pricing action. Maize, uh, Russia's got no maize to talk of. Ukraine's got some maize. Maize is a summer crop. So planting would be happening now. And the question is, again, is there planting happening? And, and the short answer is we, we don't know. But we have to assume that at least some of the wheat that's ready for harvest is not going to see its way to market. How much? 5%, 10%, 20% coming out of, of, of Ukraine. And we've got to assume the same with uh, 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 maize coming out. Now, even if we take a 10 or 20% number, on the global demand, that's not a giant number. But it is a giant number when you consider that we've already got logistic challenges, that we came into this war with maize and wheat at almost record prices. It's going to create a crunch at the margins. It absolutely is. It's going to feed into inflation to a degree, although in developed economies, Western Europe, North America, your ingredient cost, your raw material into, into something is around 15%. So you buy a, a loaf of bread for a dollar or a euro, 15 cents of that is the wheat price. Uh, the rest of it is logistics, transportation, manufacturing, marketing, retail margins, etc., etc. So it's modest. This is going to hurt more in markets, Egypt is concerned. But we've seen it in South Africa. Our prices have gone up. Heck, I mean, our sunflower oil prices have gone up. But that said, I mean, sunflower oil in the South African market, we're not a big producer of it, but we do make sunflowers, and uh, it does trade on, on, on SAFEX, on the Agri Board. Uh, it was hitting $11,000, sorry, Rand a ton back in December, and that was already record highs. As I said, we came into this war in a, in a, in a, in a tough position. So where are we? Let's look at some prices. Coal. There's a lot of story around coal. And interestingly, not much of it has to do anything with Russia. As I point out on this chart here, they're about 14% of the world's coal. That's a fair chunk of it. Uh, most of it going into Europe. You can see the massive spike. These are all going to be five-year weekly charts. You can see the massive spike in coal uh, as the war started. But, I mean, coal is, even at current levels, more than 5x what it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Trading coal directly is not easy. We used to have a ETN on coal from RMB, uh, referencing the Richards Bay Coal Terminal. That, was, that ETN was launched back in, I think, 2008, but it got shut down a decade or so ago. The easiest way to do is Thingela uh, Resources and Exara. They've both had record results. They've both said that Transnet is a bottleneck in their life. They could make more money. I thought the Thungela 18 Rand dividend was nice, but a little stingy, considering headline earnings per share was close to 64 Rand, which means they've got a 25% payout ratio. Next, just quickly go down the coal rabbit hole, because a lot of folks will tell you, yeah, but coal, but Simon, 2050, clean energy, just transition, coal is over. Yeah, okay, a couple of things. Firstly, coal's not over. Uh, are we going to hit our 2050 uh, just trans energy transition targets? No, 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 no. You know what politicians love nothing more than saying something will happen in 10 years? Why? Because either they're not there in 10 years, or if they are there in 10 years, they can say, yeah, but. Yeah, it's far enough away to, to, to sound great, but far enough away to not have any responsibility attached with it. So coal is definitely, will, will there be a point on this planet where the youth of the planet will look around and say, you expert in coal and oil? What, what were you? If you ask Kurt Vonnegut, he'll tell you we were drunk on hydrocarbons, and he is totally correct. We will get off them, but not in the next 28 years. No chance. So here is proposed coal-fired plants that are proposed for production. Okay, they're not all happening, but these are giant numbers. These are insane numbers. These are ridiculous numbers. Now, some of these, this is a, and now I can't remember the date of the chart and it's not here. Some of these are already up and running. South Africa is Kassili and, and, and Madupi. Uh, they, they, they put in the proposed thing because they're not yet 100% fully operational. Will they ever be? Who knows? Let's assume that this number is only half the size. There's a lot here. There's another issue with a coal-fired coal plant or a coal mine. Funding. 
I, a number of our local banks have said, you know what, we're not going to fund new, new, new dirty energy. Now they've walked, they've walked that back a bit. Why? Because well, bankers, politicians, you know, it, it sounds nice, but you can't practically just cut off funding. But it suddenly gets harder. India and China, not so much, because of course state banks will step in there. But even in Europe, you can see coal-fired plants coming left, right, and centre. There's a bunch of them coming through. That is coal demand. Here is uh, coal mining capacity under development, uh, pre-construction and busy in construction. You can see China, a lot that they're currently building, uh, tailing off. We've got India, Australia, a bunch happening here. Australia is suddenly going more, more wind, so this might, or more solar, green, take some of it out. And that pre-construction is certainly under risk, under threat. But it is happening. It, the, the demand for coal is still there. So I've got to say, of, of the... Of the, of the energy commodities out there, coal is my preferred. Absolutely, it's my preferred. It's just not an easy, yeah, there isn't a nice easy coal contract I can just go take a simple long position on. Brent, oil, I'm focusing on Brent, West Texas Intermediate, broadly the same. OPEC Plus is meeting as, we, as, as, we, as I'm presenting. Uh, all expectations are, and all leaks coming out is saying, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to stick to our original plan of 400,000 extra barrels per day, which we increase every two months. That seems to be what they're going to be sticking to. OPEC Plus is also quite interesting because, of course, who's the big players in OPEC Plus? Well, I mean, it's Saudi Arabia, of course, and Russia. Yeah, Russia's the second biggest member of OPEC Plus. OPEC Plus also, you know, riddled with, with uh, uh, people not sticking to quotas. But it's also the ability to turn that tap on. As I said, it's not that simple. It is a 12 to 24 month process. The, <coughs> excuse me, the spike in oil to $136 just after the war didn't surprise me. The collapse put below $100. Eh. The current weakness in oil, and as I am doing this webcast just before we came on, uh, Brent was closer to $102 a barrel. Um, and I think that's on two things. Hope that something comes out of OPEC and hope of peace talks. I wouldn't pin much on either of those two. Absolutely, I wouldn't. But let's zoom out a bit. So he has a 20-year chart of oil, and you can see that peak, which was intraday uh, back in 2008, intraday peak at about $150. GDP adjusted, that takes oil to $230. Now, I've used GDP adjusted because inflation's, you know, GDP is a better semblance. Now, are we more efficient at our use of oil? Yes. Do we need perhaps less oil? Well, we have electric vehicles, which we didn't have 14 years ago in 2008. But nonetheless, GDP adjusted an oil price, which is a lot higher than the current oil price. I think there is still risk of massive oil shock to the upside, but I do think that risk has reduced. Four weeks ago, if you had said to me oil 200, I would have said, sure, yeah, take that every single time. Uh, now you say to me oil 200, I'm like, yo, hang on. Let's first get above the 136. Let's first get to 150. Let's see how it goes. I think the risk to oil, and that quite simply is because patently people are buying Russian oil. If that stops happening, or bets are off, then 230 is a is a is a first stop point on the way to probably 300. And there is a point at which the oil price gets so high that you get demand destruction. Imagine $300 oil puts us next, say, 40 rand a litre petrol. Now we still need to go to work, right? We can't avoid going to work, and for many of us that involves using some sort of 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 uh, uh, hydrocarbon transportation. Fair enough. But if you can walk, suddenly you do. Suddenly in the weekend, do you go visit your friend who's 60 k's away or do you say to them, tell you what, let's do a Zoom lunch instead? Because suddenly that 60 k drive is going to cost you a fortune there and a fortune on the way back. And that is demand destruction. Uh, and it happens at some point. It will probably start happening closer to 200. We don't need to get to 300 just yet. I like oil. But I think the story for 200 has weakened because patently people are buying Russian oil. Gold. Yeah, so in a world, I mean, if you want safety, where do you put it right now? You can't put money in cash. 
because your cash is yielding you a couple of percentage points in Europe or America if you're lucky, and inflation is running at six, seven, eight percent. In other words, you are getting real negative yields on cash. It is not safe haven whatsoever. Uh, Bitcoin is, or crypto is not your safe haven. Crypto is a risk on asset. What I mean by that is when the world is crashing, as we saw back in March of 2020 with the pandemic, crypto goes down with it as well. When the tech stocks are rallying and all the bets are on and everyone's buying stuff, crypto goes as well. Crypto has become a risk asset. It, 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 it trades like the other risk assets out there. So where's your safe haven? It surely, it, it can't just be money in the bank because inflation is killing it. You would have to say, if this isn't gold's moment in time, then what is? I mean, with, with respect to gold, it did in the 2020 uh, pandemic, it, it, it came to the party. It absolutely did, and, and it needed to. And at the beginning of the war, it came to the party, and it needed to. But now, you know, it was hitting what? It was 20, uh, 2040, 2060. Now it's... 1925 and even lower. Gold is surprising me. Uh, I, I still think that there's a lot of story for gold. And let's be clear, in my entire life, before the pandemic, the only time I bought a gold share was when I closed a short. Literally, I was never in my life long gold. Pandemic, I went long gold. I went long a gold miner. I made some money on it. It was Pan-African. I took my money and ran, and I picked up some more gold uh, uh, as the war started. And that trade is currently underwater, but I am holding it for now. Because if gold to prove itself as a you know, safe haven type anti-inflation, now's your time to step up. If not now, when? I mean, what are you waiting for? The nukes to go off? Palladium? So palladium shot through the roof. No surprise. Uh, hit a, a, an all-time, well, not an, yeah, an all-time high. Uh, at above $3,000 an ounce um, because Russia provides a quarter of it. There are two challenges with Palladium. One, obviously, people are buying it. But two, because of the issues with chip shortages, uh, the demand for Palladium has weakened because we're just making less motor vehicles. Now, beginning of this year, I spoke to a couple of, of, of uh, supply chain experts on my Money Web Now podcast and asked them, okay, so where are we with supply chain crisis? And they, to a person, said, you know what? We're not out of the woods, but it'll get better over the course of the year. It will be lumpy, but supply chains are improving. And certainly we're seeing it. Truck rates in the U.S. have, have more than halved. Uh, the, the wait times at uh, L.A. port have come down at one point from you know, 30, 40 days. They're now down to 10, 15, 20 days. I mean, things are definitely moving in the right direction. But then we also get the shutdowns coming out of China which is, is, is hurting. Foxconn suddenly gets shut down. Uh, Apple is cutting back production on uh, earpods and uh, iPhone SEs by 20% in next quarter. Not due to lack of demand, but just struggling with chips. And that's what we're seeing. And that is going to hurt the palladium. The, the, the medium-term palladium story remains massively bullish, right? And let's ignore... Uh, 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 green energy and all of that. That is a that is definitely a PGM story, but that's a 5, 10, 20, 50 year story. In the next sort of, you know, three to five years, uh, we start seeing supply chains come back. We start seeing demand return to the, well, not demand, supply return to the motor vehicle industry. And from that, demand, because there's pent up demand. There's folks out there who want a car and there's a six month waiting list. Uh, some of them are waiting. Some of them are going, ah, we'll run it for another year. We'll come back to you next year. There certainly is. If you see Combined Motor Holdings had their trading update earlier today uh, and a very, very strong trading update. Yes, some of it is low base, but some of it was also just demand. We saw Avis update from Barlow World uh, earlier this week. Was it Wednesday, Tuesday? Today's Thursday. It was Tuesday. Um, and their Avis is just absolutely pumping. If you are going on holiday and you need a, I used to be able to fly to Cape Town and book a car at the airport on the way to Cape Town and pay 250 Rand per day. Now you can't book a car to Cape Town for under a thousand. And that's if you got three weeks notice. I and mean, the number of people I know who are flying somewhere and they're like, I can't get a car. I'm flying in a month. There's no car available. Uh, those rental companies are going to need to increase fleet sizes, but they can't get the stock. So the palladium story is strong, and there's still shortages in palladium, notwithstanding the recycling coming in. Quick rabbit hole. PGM recycling. You don't recycle a car for the PGM. You recycle the car for the steel. 
And then if you recycle for the steel, we'll take the PGM at the same price. What drives steel is iron ore. So when the iron ore price is high, cars get recycled and PGMs come back into the market. Iron ore about $150, that's high for iron ore. If a fair price for iron ore is probably closer to 60. Questions coming, what do I think a fair price for oil is? Under normal circumstances, these aren't normal. I think oil is a $60, $70 uh, per barrel. Absolutely, I do. These aren't normal. Uh, Satrix Resi, uh, trading at all-time highs earlier in the month. Uh, I am long here as well. You can see that collapse in uh, January, uh, February, March of 2020. Uh, but that is just the 10 largest uh, commodity stocks on the JSE. So commodities, longs, agris, I like them, especially wheat, but those farmer input costs are soaring. Diesel, uh, labor, uh, particularly in, in, in parts of the US, um, uh, fertilizer. So input costs are, are, are soaring. What we're getting, we're getting a squeeze. We're getting that squeeze coming through. Normally, what you're looking for, if a commodity is booming, you buy the producer because they get that leverage effect. But that leverage effect is going to be dampened by the inflation, particularly in the agri space. Energy, coal, gas, and oil, Europe is still buying. OPEC is not going to do anything crazy. Uh, coal is my preferred, uh, but I'm long oil. And I'm going to come back to my exact holdings in some time. PGMs, especially palladium, as I said, chip shortages, reducing demand. Uh, and then the Resi 10 index, markets.com will have that on their platform in the next couple of weeks. Resi 10 is the, the easy way to do it. And you can also put that in a tax-free account. So let's look at FX. I am focusing on the commodity FXs, but obviously US dollar. Here is, remember I mentioned the ruble a moment ago, and I said Russia wanted to, wanted uh, bad people to pay them in, in rubles? Look what happened to the ruble. Don't let, I mean, you know, you think Russia's at war and therefore the ruble should be toast. And it was toast there for a bit, and now it's kind of, look, it's still at its worst level in five years. Yes, absolutely it is. But it is well off the 140 almost it hit in the early days of the war. And this ruble is probably going to strengthen a bit more. What does that tell you more than anything else? That Russia is getting dollars. How is Russia getting dollars? By selling dollar commodities. Those dollar commodities are oil, gas, wheat, palladium, platinum. Yeah. People are buying their commodities. There is the clearest evidence that you have. People are buying Russian commodities. This is not oligarchs taking their dollars back home and turning it into rubles. Not a chance. Here's the US dollar index, which has been strengthening since the middle of last year. I did a presentation middle of last year. I'll show you a link in a moment. Uh, titled Grand, Stronger for Longer. And it's looked silly for a while, but I still buy that. Uh, and here's why. Yeah, look at our RAND, but let's look at the dollar versus the RAND over the last year. There's an outperformance here of about 8%. Why? Because of the commodities. So what happens is quite simply is we, not we, South African miners sell their gold, platinum, palladium, citrus, wheat, maize on the international markets in dollars. Then they convert it into RANDs. So notwithstanding that we've seen the dollar index strengthening and that's against the euro the yen against the majors new zealand dollar uh hong kong dollar uh, uh swiss franc all of those yes but not against the commodity currencies of which south africa is one of them now when i did my presentation back last year uh the czar was about 14 it went to 16 and change which confused the heck out of me because yes Commodities peaked at exactly that point, but they are still at giant levels, and we are still clocking about an extra 15 to 20 billion rand a month in terms of, of, of revenue from that. It is huge. No, my bad. Tax from that, not even just revenue as a country. We did 180 billion extra tax in the last year, thanks pretty much to the miners, because it wasn't anybody else who was doing it, it was the miners. So, Aussie dollar, also considered a commodity currency, but not enough for me to get terribly excited about it. Uh, and then uh, uh, Brazilian rail, which actually quite an amazing chart there. So 
you can see the absolute collapse when the pandemic happened. What hasn't happened is a recovery much, more of a sideways, but now definitely breaking lowers and at the best levels since pandemic started. So in the space here, there's the link to the Stronger for long, Longer. Just head to justonelap.com, type Stronger for Longer, you'll find the video. So commodity currencies against the US dollar, uh, expecting both stronger. My preferred here, Brazilian real and the dollar. As, sorry, the czar. I, as a rule, do not like trading secondary more minor currencies, which the real and the czar most definitely are because of volatility and the like. It's just not a fun place to be. But in this time, I've taken a nice, simple, casual, ungeared position, and I'm expecting that RAND to move stronger. Uh, and, and the risks to it, we'll touch on some of those in a moment. So in closing, and then we'll take questions galore. I've said it before, that pre-war was a placey place for commodities. You folks remember April 20, 2020. Oil went negative. Now, I can't show this to you in my charts because my charts don't show minus because my charts don't show minus because it's the craziest idea ever. People were paying $40 a barrel for other people to take the oil. In other words, he has a barrel of oil and he has $40. Now, let's quickly delve down here. This was the West Texas Intermediate uh, for delivery in May. In other words, delivery was in 15 days time. And this is a physically delivered uh, uh, futures contract. Most futures contract cash settled, no worries. Brent, you haven't got it, cash settled, no worries. Some exceptions, agris in South Africa, physical delivery or cash settlement. This one is cash is physical settlement only. And the problem was quite simple. They had run out of space in Louisiana to store oil, which meant you had your barrel of oil and 40 bucks because someone paid you to take it. But now where do you put the barrel of your oil? Okay, in the back seat of your car, I suppose. But that was, and hence oil went negative for a very, very short period of time. It wasn't a, a, a long-term thing in the least, uh, but it did go negative. And it was, and I want to say it remains the craziest thing I've ever seen. Absolutely. But then you get more craziness. Now, nickel wasn't the craziest, but it's certainly a top 10. Nickel's been bubbling along, and then suddenly nickel went absolutely crazy. It reports that there was a giant fund who were short, and they got squeezed. So the LME in London halted nickel trading and reversed trades. Amateur hour. Yeah, someone got burnt and lost their fingers. That is what, you know, if I get burnt and lose my fingers, I mean, do I cry myself to sleep? You betcha. Do I phone the JAC and say, that's unfair, this is not nice? Do I act like a five-year-old had their sucker stolen? Well, that's what the LME did. They decided, oh, no, no, we'll reverse some trades. And then they reopened the market. I think it was eight days later. Was it really eight days they were closed? And it was a complete and utter mess because of uh, what it, uh, limits, limit up, or there's limit downs actually. And it was an absolute craze. So, I mean, we're seeing crazy stuff. You know, is, is it, could something suddenly happen somewhere that sends a commodity going crazy? Yes. Which direction will it be? Up. I know, oil. But that really was situation specific. At, you know, in April 20, none of us had left our houses for a month. No, I hadn't used oil in a month. You know, it was, it was, it was you know, fundamentally crazy times. Every airplane in the world was grounded. Every car in the world was parked. The demand for oil disappeared. So park that aside. It was a, it's, a, it's a point you're going to tell your great-grandchildren about. They're not going to believe you. And you're going to struggle because you're going to pull up the oil chart and it won't show you negative because charts don't show negative because we don't trade in minus numbers. The risk to all commodities remains something somewhere happens. What is that happening? I, it, it, I mean, there's so many. I could give you a list of 100. I'm not going to bother. But, you know, the risk is, well, sure, the risk is, the positive risk is that OPEC comes and says, hey, folks, we're going to pump an extra 5 million barrels a day. Yeah, okay. But I would put a likelihood at that at minute. The risk is, is that suddenly Russia can't deliver oil uh, and, and, and there's a massive spike. The risk is that there's a pipeline issue. There's a risk that suddenly nuclear starts to break out somewhere. Maybe it's a leak from Chernobyl or one of the nuclear power plants. Maybe it's a warhead that someone sets off. Who knows? The risk to all of these commodities is the spike. And the point is when it spikes, it is too late. You want to be positioned. That's the key point in my sense. So commodities remain volatility, likely move higher, but messy. If there is a spike, it's going to be higher. The mine leverage, perhaps less extreme. I said that already in the agris. 
normally if you're looking at commodities you look at the miner and you say hmm but not always in this case there are exceptions but like as i said i am staying away from 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 the agris just because those farmers are, are, are taking uh, quite severe pressure um this is fast changing this can happen in a second peace if peace breaks out markets will boo but that doesn't remove the sanctions from russia but again what's not being sanctioned well energy so if peace breaks out russia's in trouble but if peace breaks out man just get rid of your energy stocks and just buy just buy stuff just buy stuff you know go buy nasdaq buy s p buy top 40 heck buy process and naspas even my current open trades short us dollar expecting uh strength from the rand i'm expecting it lower uh, I am long oil, gold, uh, Sabanya Stillwater, Renogen, and Resi 10. Uh, oil, I hold the, the ETN. Uh, it is kind of breaking. I actually came into this year with a position in oil, and I have been adding to it. I added some as war broke with a pullback. I think I got it about 124, so that's my high position. My low position, I think, is 92 or maybe 88, about there. So at this point, more oil trade is, 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 is at break even because fortunately more of the buying happened last year than this year. I am long gold. Uh, my average entry on gold is about 19, uh, 1995. Let's call it 2000. I'm under water on that trade. And of course, in all cases, the czar is hurting. I'm long Sabanya Stillwater. I've been long Sabanya Stillwater since 2019 and I picked up a whole bunch more in 2020 and then I picked up a whole bunch more last year when it was trading at about 48. It went down to 44 or so. I was picking up 48 and I think some at 51 as well. I'm long Renogen. Uh, Renogen is a speculative play that they, they will start producing some LNG and some helium next month, but that's only phase one. Phase two, which will be 20x bigger is still a couple of years away and they need to raise the money but they just keep on coming out with great great reports i spoke with stefano marani and my uh ceo at renogen on my money web podcast earlier in the week go listen to that he talks about we've got enough gas in the free state to be energy independent we just got to make it work uh, i'm long resi 10 i've been long resi 10 since uh, February of last year, I've been adding repeatedly. I added some more in February, or in fact, in March of this year, I put it into my tax-free account. I can't remember the level, so I, I don't know where that trade is at the moment. I'm watching Waiting Thungela. Uh, that's my preferred coal play. I, I would like to just get some coal. Thungela has problems around inflation, but their bigger problem is Transnet. Uh, the trick is, is that coal is just, I, I can't find a nice, clean, easy way to trade it. Um, so I take uh, Thungela as it. I'm looking if there's any weakness from it. Maybe that weakness comes when dividends get Hey. Contacts, uh, disclaimers, folks, let's take some questions. We've got some time left. Yeah, Michael, you make a, you make a great point. I mean, the one thing uh, uh, that Michael's talking about, he says Bitcoin dominates uh, donations from Bitcoin is globally a big role in helping Ukraine government. Uh, more than 100 million has been donated. And that is one of the benefits of Bitcoin. So is Bitcoin anonymous? Eh, Pseudo anonymous. Right. If I send Michael a Bitcoin, the blockchain records that this hash, this hash sent to that hash. Right. So they don't know who they are necessarily. But if I then also send some to Solomon at, at, at markets.com and some here and some there and some everywhere else, you can start to build a spider web. And trust me, what the, what the, what the FBI is doing is they've got a giant chart and they're starting to piece together. They Let's say they break into my flat one day and they find my Bitcoin wallet. Now they know my Bitcoin number. So they go to their chart and they say, cool. That is Simon Brown. Ah, so who did he send to? So they start to piece that together. So it's pseudo-anonymous, but it's efficient for cross-border. That it most definitely is. And as Michael's saying, I mean, in excess of 100 million uh, has, has been donated. And, and you know, th there was lots happening. I mean, in the early days, people were booking Airbnb in Ukraine and say, don't worry, I'm not coming to your country with respect. There's a war going on. But hey, I'm trying to get some money to you, so let me book your Airbnb. Uh, you know, I'll leave you a lovely review, say things, nice things about me, and, and here is some cash. But the easiest way to do it was crypto, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, Ruin, yeah, gold crashing. I mean, the world is saying that everything is okay, and that's what the gold price is telling me. I'm saying, yo, look, we've had a crazy decade, and we're only 
what, uh, uh, 28 months into, no, 20, 27 months into the decade, and it has been a crazy decade. Um, is everything okay? No. Is everything going to be okay? Probably. But there are risks out there. And I, I'm holding uh, that as a as a as a uh, 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 a risk uh, sort of my 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 oil yeah my my goal very much is just a risk premium just in case because you know is Putin going to do a nuclear weapon probably not but if he does yo 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 what goes up gold maybe maybe not even gold um. Michael, all in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, so Michael, as I understand you, I mean, you've you got, I mean, so, so the thing with crypto and, and Bitcoin in particular, Bitcoin has become a risk asset. And what I mean by that, let me haul up a Bitcoin chart here. Um, and let's zoom out a bunch. I mean, you can see in in uh, uh, the, the, the sell off there, the, the pandemic uh, fear. Bitcoin collapsed. It absolutely did. Uh, it, it lost more than 50%. It went from 10 and a half to, let's call it four. Uh, it collapsed. What it does, though, is that its recovery from, let's call it four, to, let's call it 48, is 12x. There's not much else out there that has increased 12x during that period. Oddly, West Texas Intermediate is one of them. And and Brent has done great. You know, Brent was what twelve or fourteen dollars. Now it's a hundred plus dollars. It's five or six x up. But Bitcoin took the cake there. It absolutely did. Um, more questions coming through. Yeah, so there are there are ETFs coming out of the U.S. Energy ETFs that you can can look at. There's bunches of those which give you the exposure to it. Some of them are pure commodity energy ETFs. Uh, I did a, a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago looking at that, which is focused on energy, some in the energy in terms of the raw commodity, some in the energy in terms of the the the, the, the actual producers of the commodity. Uh, Michael, in terms of the role it plays in the war, it comes down to that ease of use. And, and to pseudo-anonymous, it's not unimportant. You know, in the olden days, in fact, I interviewed someone on my show on Monday, uh, Mr. Saransky, who is Saransky Diamonds, right? And he's talking about diamonds and how they, I mean, he's basically telling us how to smuggle diamonds. I'm like, dude, you're on a live radio show. You should not be saying that. I didn't say that. I just thought it. And, and he's right. You know, I can put thousands of dollars of diamonds in my pocket and walk across a border and everything's cool. But I can't get my diamond to Michael right now. Bitcoin, I can get my diamond. I can click, 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 click. I can send my Bitcoins across. Yeah, it's sometimes a little bit clunky, sometimes a little bit expensive, sometimes a little bit slow, but it's that able to move. And the point is that if I want to send Czar or dollar, if I want to send dollar to Michael, it's as hard as hell, Hades. And if I want to send Czar and they suddenly don't like one of us, you know, because I'm an oligoth or something, if you're an oligoth, what are you doing right now? Bitcoin. Uh, and, and, yeah, so are criminals using Bitcoin? Sure. But what is criminals' favorite thing? U.S. dollars, actual physical notes, untraceable, completely anonymous. Lovely. That's the role that Bitcoin plays. And in something like a war like this, make no mistake, it's not just people getting money to, 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 to help, as happened, $100 million worth, probably even more in time. But just getting moving money around. Infrastructures are collapsing. Yeah, if you're in Russia, do you know that your bank will be there tomorrow? Well, Bitcoin's your answer. If you're if you're in a, a war zone, I mean, we've seen it in 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 countries where where economies collapse and 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 markets collapse and currencies collapse. Folks go to Bitcoin because it's it's sort of a pseudo network is what I'm trying to say. It's not swift. Yeah, so you've got uh, – actually, it's a great point. So you've got the USDT, which is a digital dollar, which when I first saw those digital dollars, I'm like, why? Like, to what purpose? The purpose is quite simple. So USDT is the big one. There's a couple of them. The benefit of that is you pegged to the dollar, right? So what have you got? You've basically got dollars. So you don't get that volatility. So if I want to send money to my granny in Ukraine, I don't have a granny in Ukraine, but if I wanted to send money to my granny in Ukraine, uh, let's say she's in Russia, um, and I try to send it to her via the normal banking system, is it going to get to it? Will she be able to draw it at an ATM? Et cetera, et cetera. I mean, all of those type of issues. So then I use Bitcoin, but maybe it collapses while my granny's trying to work out how to open a Bitcoin wallet and everything else. So then I send a USDT, which is essentially 
it's dollars, it's backed by dollars, but it's using the blockchain technology, which makes it hugely important. Uh, Bitcoin ETS coming soon. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a huge. And in fact, I was chatting with someone yesterday who's got an arbit who wants to create a Bitcoin arbitrage ETF. So you know the arbitrage where you often find in different territories, so South Africa, Bitcoin's at different prices to America, and you can arbitrage that. But he's taking it a step further. Rather than arbitraging the, the across markets, because then you've got currencies, and in South Africa, exchange controls, he's arbitraging within Europe. So a bunch of exchanges in Europe, and all he needs is a quarter percent difference. And, you know, buy, sell, boom, lock in the profit. You make yourself a quarter percent. You do that a couple of hundred times a day. Uh, you're absolutely. Uh, Bitcoin will decouple NASDAQ in five years. Yeah, I mean, there's already a decoupling. Let me, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know this chart package well enough, and then it does me some totally nonsense like that. No, that's not what I'm expecting to see. I don't know if that's actually giving me a clear picture. There's already decoupling to a degree, uh, particularly on the upside. Uh, what Bitcoin needs to become is, is, is less of a risk asset. The short answer is that when the world panics, they sell everything. Why? Because they want cash. They want to have physical dollars or czars. Usually they want dollars and euros and yen, and they'll sell anything. And what they sell is the stuff that's easy to sell. That Picasso on your wall is not easy to sell. That Bitcoin in your wallet is easy to sell. That Krugerrand, moderately easy. That gold ETF, nice and easy to sell. Those equities that you hold, very easy to sell. So back in March of 2000, when things were collapsing, everything collapses. Why? Because people are going to dollars. They just want dollar. And truthfully, you sell whatever is easiest to sell. Let me remove that because I don't know what that is trying to show me. That is not going through what I'm seeing there as well. Uh, questions coming through, whether Brent or West Texas, it's the same. Brent and West Texas, uh, they're both in oil. West Texas trades slightly cheaper, but they largely, apart, they, they, they decoupled when West Texas went negative. Um, but that's because Brent isn't physically settled. You can cash settle it, so you didn't have the, the, the challenge there. But otherwise, they usually, they're more or less move in lockstep. Uh, West Texas is a little bit cheaper because easier to refine. And there are nuances. When we say Brent, there are dozens of different flavors of Brent. And when we say West Texas, there are hundreds of flavors of West Texas. I mean, you get Kentucky North, you get Kentucky North North, you get Kentucky Northwest. Um, and those are just three in one area that is probably, you know, no bigger than Santa. But they, they, they're different, uh, 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 slightly different sweetnesses to them, um, and then need slightly different process, processing to them. So certainly, you know, which is it, whichever is, is, is available in the sense. I mean, I'm not stressing which. I, I refer to Brent because I, I'd like it there. Um, yeah, Michael, you prefer Bitcoin for your services rather than RANDs? Yeah. I work for banks. <laughs> you ask them to pay you in Bitcoin, <laughs> they're probably going to run uh, uh, a mile. Um, I'm interested, Michael, that you long gold as well. Uh, but are you long that um, the Pax gold? Uh, because that's essentially Pax gold is a digital gold, again, backed by gold. And it solves that problem. If I go to Krugerrand, how do I get to my granny in, 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 in Russia? And then how does she do anything with it? I slip it through through the system. Um, and, and that's, that's that's as I said, I mean, you know, there's talk a lot around cryptos, uh, but what 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 you get from it is 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 that blockchain. Question coming: What cryptos do I hold? I hold Bitcoin. I mined a bunch of them a decade or so ago. I think I got nine coins. They were worth about a dollar. I sold a couple at two hundred dollars. I hold the rest, uh, and then I picked up more. I can't remember the dollar price. It was at 204,000 Rand per coin. I picked up some. And then I've got the Revix basket. So I like the Revix basket. Here's my challenge. Um, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding of your strategy is you just, new coins come, you buy them. I don't know which are going to be, I mean, Solana, uh, Polkadot, uh, Luna, all these new coins that have taken the world by storm. I'm, I'm, unless I'm buying everything, I'm not going to spot them in time. And I, yeah, you know, I've, 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 I've mined cryptos. I've made my own cryptocurrency. Uh, no one wanted to buy it from me because Simon's super uh, special coin didn't seem to have any flavor with people. Um, I've got a friend who's a, a, a guru cryptologist, uh, so I understand the concept of it. But how am I going to pick the next winner? So I get the Revex basket. 
equal weight, 10 Bitcoins, nice and simple. We picked up Solana at about $40, still holding it. Solana at 150 I think it's back to around 80 or 90 uh, It is still there. Yeah, Michael, buy top 20, buy top 10. Uh, nice and easy, simple like that. Uh, folks, I'm going to park it there. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, uh, and we are hitting our time. Um, we'll park, so to recap, those are my positions. I'm watching Thongela. The oil and the gold are not doing what I would expect them to do, except that obviously people are buying Russian oil. So that's, you know, I suppose maybe I expected people to have a little bit of morals and, you know, stand with Ukraine, but capitalism hasn't got time for that type of thing. Um, but I still hold it because if, 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 if something goes horror, we're going to see some prices do insane things. You know, I, I remember in 2008, I was on the trading floor, Oil broke $100 days later, maybe weeks later, 150 It just happens in an absolute flash. So those are kind of like my, my expectations. My Sabanya, my Resi 10, I'm liking. My currency, I'm expecting more strength on the Tsar going through. I'm watching Thongera. Ladies and gents, you all have a good day. Further, uh, stay safe, look after yourself. Uh, and if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.